Well, thank you very much and welcome to our audience for this panel-led webinar entitled SFTR to SFDR. And a very big thank you to, um, uh, from Hansuke to our uh, partners, the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investments, uh, to Securities Finance Times, and of course, to ISLA, the International Securities Lending Association. So thank you very much for pulling this thing together. And since uh, SFTR came into play back in 2016, there has been a big change in uh, transparency around transactions. And um, now there is a move towards a transparency around sustainability. And EU's Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulations, or SFDR for short, um, is a series of sustainability-related disclosures that came into that come into force from March 2021. And as it stands, it will require extensive disclosures for all firms that operate across the EU. So I'm delighted to be hosting a panel of experts drawn <laughs> from the securities lending industry who will be hopefully educating us through their insights and help also helping us to see what lies ahead. I am Ali Kazmi and I'm the moderator and I'm from Hansuke Consulting. With that, if I may invite you, Farah, to introduce yourself, please. Sure. Um, I'm Farah Mahmood. I am a senior regulatory analyst at the International Security Lending Association um, and part of the Reg and Tech team. I've been at ISLA for about a year and a half now, focusing on, at the moment, the ESG regulatory whirlwind that's coming towards us this year. Um, including looking at the sustainable finance disclosure regulation and its impacts to our industry. Uh, prior to ISLA, I was at JP Morgan Chase for a number of years, working in securities lending for the Pine Brokerage business. Excellent, Farah. Thank you very much. Then we have Danny. Hi, Ali. Thank you. Hi, I'm Danny Corrigan. Uh, I'm on the board of uh, CISI and a trustee. That's my best job, actually. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I chair the international group, a wonderful group, group of uh, real, real alpha females and male, uh, males there. Um, I am the CEO, would you believe, of London Reporting House, which is an entity which we've just set up, goes live March 22nd, when lockdown ends. That's the guess. Uh, London Reporting House, which is uh, basically using SFTR data repurposed for... Uh, for, uh, effectively for the ability to actually use the firms to be able to use it themselves and others in a much, much better way, including uh, green bonds, including green repo, including all kinds of sustainability uh, issues. Uh, we'll come to that a bit later on. Uh, prior to this, I've been involved in repo market forever and I was, in, I was at uh, CME, European uh, Trade Repository uh, under ESMA and we set that up and did trade transaction reporting under EMEA for a number of years there. That's me. Fantastic. Excellent credentials there. And last but not least are uh, the doyen of the securities lending industry, our very own Roy Zimmer Hansel. Thanks very much, Ali, for the kind words. Uh, and thanks CSI, CISI and everyone else that's uh, sponsoring and supporting this. Uh, so I'm Roy Zimmer Hansel. I'm principal at Pierpoint Financial. Uh, consultancy that's focused specifically on the securities finance space, so securities lending, repo, collateral management. Uh, if Danny has been in uh, repo forever, I've been in securities lending forever, uh, and somehow he's managed to hang on to his hair. So, so maybe that's the business I should have <laughs> I should have followed. Um, look, we've been talking about ESG for uh, probably about two and a half years actively to customers. And, you know, I've been watching the trends uh, as they've been growing, as investors have become more engaged. Uh, I think there's a real convergence here between what investors want and what regulators are trying to deliver, whether they are or not. Maybe that's what we're talking about. Uh, but certainly there's there's an alignment of interests uh, to some degree. Um, I, I'm also, uh, for my sins, I'm also part of the uh, College of Advisors for the Global Principles for Sustainable Securities Lending, which really tries to bring together 
views from a really wide range of stakeholders. Because the interesting thing about ESG, unlike unlike something like SFTR, the the the, the issues involve stakeholders from regulators, investors, uh, journalists, person on the street. You know, literally ESG affects everyone, and so GPSSL tries to be uh, an all-encompassing sort of uh, repository for views, ideas, and principles. So this is very much at the heart of what we do. Excellent. Thank you very much. And as moderator, my job has become so much easier when you have a panel with such great credentials. So um, with that, what the way we've structured it today is to just ask each panelist to give us a view of uh, what they have seen, what are they currently working on, and once we have had that, then we will open ourselves up to general questions, both from the floor. And um, I've got a whole host of questions to ask these guys uh, as well. So if I may ask, Danny, perhaps, you know, you mentioned SFTR and you've been intimately involved with that. Would you like to, you know, lead that discussion, please? Sure, certainly. Um, so there's nothing new here. A lot of this reporting started way, way back. It was the mainstay of tradies coming into the city of London. Uh, the shops used to have uh, big adverts in the window saying, Bank of England returns three pounds an hour. And so people would get jobs. There'd be youngsters coming in, you know, they didn't necessarily go to university. And Bank of England returns were very, they, they, there was a straightforward report that you filled in a box, each bank did every day. And that was sent off. And that, that, and that process is used all over the world. And that was... The first, that was a form of regulatory reporting. What actually happened with that happened then with we Mifia One, with the London Stock Exchange, there's always been reporting around equity transactions and so forth, really since the Big Bang. So Bank of England returns, Big Bang reporting there. With the financial crisis in Pittsburgh in 2009, they said, we've got to do something about this. And there's six things we're going to do things about. We're going to have automated trading, essentially clearing, trade reporting and so forth. And then they threw in one line, they said, yeah, and also repo. And it's like, where did that come from? And there was a belief that Lehman Brothers went under because of the size of its leverage and repo had caused that. You know, a lot of us would know that's not the case at all, but that was what they said. So they said, we should have reporting. Now, the only people that took them up on that was uh, in the European Union, and that's what led to uh, SFTR. So a whole series of things got rolled out around derivatives, Dodd-Frank Act, as you know, uh, EMEA in Europe. But for repo, Secure, buy, sells, securities lending, and margin lending it was SFTR. The great thing about it, it was the last to come, and it actually is pretty good. It's much, much better than the mere reporting. It's more complicated, but the people involved in it, from the regulators through, have done a better job. And so if you look at, say, the public, uh, publicly available websites from the three major TRs, Regis, uh, London Stock Exchange, Univista, and DTCC, um, you'll see that the quality of the data is very good. And, and there's something called an act back and an act back. It's a bit technical, but it, essentially that tells you back from the TR whether you've reported correctly. And in repo, that's running about 97%. So it's good. It's really, really good. And so the easiest thing in the world, if anyone gets together in, in, the, in the, either the repo market or the report market will bitch and moan about the reporting, but it's actually good. And look at it compared to a mirror and say it's good. And it's more useful, for instance, than they have in America for STR. So SFTR came in last year, uh, July 13th and October 13th, and it's, I think it's got better and better. Now, if you really want to know what's going on, just go on to LinkedIn, look up Richard Komoto, who uh, is this fabulous fellow being in the repo market longer than me or anyone else. And, and they at ICMA, they put together one a great paper. It's about 300 pages long about all the different things you need to do for reporting. But if you want to know what's going on, and what percentage of the market is automated trade, essentially, whatever, go there, look at that. Uh, and where that is evolved to, so that looks good. It's now they say, well, where, where are we on sustainability and ESG and green bonds? We saw last week the Bank of England got told, you not lend money against transport companies and oil companies, only lend them against green bonds. How on earth would you know? Well, actually, you probably can. If you, again, look at Richard's stuff, you put in there, you look at the LEI, the issuer, you look at the ice of the bond, so take this string and start thinking of it as magic. It's not data, it's information. It's wisdom. When Komoto gets his hands on it, it's wisdom. And look in there, and you'll be able to see that. So that's a really, really good thing. So just in terms of granularity, in terms of 
in the bond market or repo market, I guess equities as well, and Roy will tell us there, you can tell. So uh, if you will, SFTR is somewhere between the Bank of England returns and SFDR, and that's where we are right now, but very, very usable. And we at London Reporting House, of course, one little plug, of course, I've got that string and we'll point you in the right direction. As if, if there is a list of sustainable bonds that the Bank of England needs to know about, we've got it for them. That's me. Just, Danny, before I, just, I, I will ask a question. Do you think SFDR, what its intended purpose was? Do you think that has been achieved? And if so, at what cost? Cost is enormous. The, the firms had to come together, the banks, asset managers, hedge funds, and so forth, uh, broker dealers had to come together and they got they had to get the uh, reference data, transaction data, and counterparty data together into this string. And they've done that at enormous cost. I heard one bank, it cost them 20 million to get that right for all the uh, all different reporting regimes. Uh, yeah, it was worth it if the regulators are looking at it correctly. And all I can say is, if you're not involved in reporting, but you're a repo or securities lending person, ask to have a look at it. And then just say, hold on a second. And it's like this, it's like Otto Lengi's cookbook. You take that, 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 and that, those ingredients, and you get a great meal. It's like every element of the periodic table is in there. You want to make a compound, it's there. So was it designed for that? No, it was designed for the regulators, but use it as your firms, yeah? But again... Richard Camotto, have a look at the stuff there, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. So I, the answer is, I, I'd say there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic, so Danny. And, uh, sorry, you cut out there. Sorry, Danny. So just so in summary, the, it, it's the data's good, and if the regulators and the providers will look at it, they'll realise it's a goldmine. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Danny. Really appreciate it. And that imagery of being a meal, uh, that will stick with me. With that, uh, if I can perhaps invite uh, Farah, who's, um, I think you've got lots and lots of really up-to-date information as to what's happening. Um, over to you, Farah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so unlike SFDR, oh, SFDR is, um, is pretty new. Uh, it goes back to 2016 when the European Commission uh, established a high-level expert group on sustainable finance, which comprised of around 20 senior experts, uh, including members of the financial industry. Um, and this group's core mandate was to advise the Commission on how to mainstream sustainability into risk management. So the recommendations of that group were used to form the 2018 action plan, which consisted of 10 key actions and action number seven uh, called for clarification of asset managers and institutional investors uh, duties regarding sustainability and a proposal for the regulation on disclosures of sustainable activities. In 2019, co-legislators adopted SFDR uh, as it is today. And it's due to apply, as you mentioned, from the 10th of March this year with uh, a phased in approach. So we're getting uh, pretty close to the go live now. So SFDR uh, introduces uh, transparency disclosure requirements for alternative investment funds, uh, USITs, credit institutions or investment firms that are subject to MIFID reporting for portfolio management services in respect of how they integrate sustainability risks into their investment decisions. And one of the main purposes of SFDR is to address concerns that disclosures are currently inconsistent across the market, right? Which makes it difficult for end investors to compare and make more uh, informed investment decisions. So, in scope firms will be required to publish written policies on the integration of sustainability risks in their investment decision making processes. Uh, they'll be required to make contractual disclosures on how they incorporate these risks into their businesses or product, uh, as well as publish an online description on their websites on the methodologies used uh, to assess and evaluate the effectiveness of investments. Um, and finally, uh, firms also describe, they must describe in periodic reports the specification of the impacts of sustainable investments. So it's, it's really important, important to note that even if you do not offer an ESG focused product as such, in scope firms may still be captured by this regulation. So 
where are we now and, and what's the timeline? Um, last year, the ESAs published a consultation paper setting out proposals for the regulatory technical standards or the level two, uh, which closed in September 2020 last year. And the original intention was to submit the final report on the RTS by December 2020 so that the Commission could adopt the level two measures prior to the go live in March this year. However, obviously, due to um, mainly resource constraints from the pandemic, we say um, in November last year, the Commission actually confirmed a delay of the level two measures, but advised that they were still expecting firms to comply with the high level uh, level one requirements from March 2021. And then in early January this year, the ESAs uh, sent a letter to the Commission asking for clarification uh, over some of the central issues in the framework due to the lack of the level two measures. Um, one of those uh, requests being the most important to ISLA members is the call for further clarity on the meaning of promotion in the context of products that are not ESG focused. However, they promote environmental or social characteristics. And we're hoping to receive a response to that letter any day now from, from the Commission and certainly uh, fingers crossed before the go live in March. Uh, and then all of a sudden last week, the East has actually published the draft regulatory technical standards, which was slightly unexpected. However, um, they have suggested that these should apply from January 2022 onwards. Um, and in terms of next steps, the proposal will go through the normal administrative processes and the Commission may choose to either adopt or reject this draft. Um, if adopted, it will go through a three month scrutiny period via the European Parliament and, and the Council. But in terms of what uh, ISLA are doing at the moment, at the beginning of 2020, we launched the ISLA Council for Sustainable Finance, which was uh, managed externally and made up primarily of beneficial owners who created the principles for sustainable securities lending. And once that body of work was completed um, in December last year, Andy Dyson and I launched the Isla ESG steering group in house, uh, which has representation from lenders, borrowers, uh, collateral managers, as well as beneficial owners. So we can get that uh, broader perspective. Um, if anyone is an ISLA member and you're interested in joining that group, I'm going to do a little plug, um, then please reach out to me. We actually have a steering group scheduled for tomorrow to talk about SFDR, uh, in particular around the ambiguities of the scope and its impact to securities lending, um, as well as producing a Q&A for members with uh, Alan Overy uh, as counsel um, that we've recently partnered with. Uh, to put together a white paper which is also due to be released very shortly and will be publicly available to all so uh, keep an eye out for that one and uh, Alan and Overy have also been uh, assisting ISLA with producing a industry standard for the draft wording of the website disclosures that I, that I mentioned earlier uh, which we'll also be able to share with members in the coming weeks so sure we'll thanks Sarah discussing. just in terms of this deferral or possibly yeah. taking it to January 2022. Is that, you think, a realistic uh, chance of getting that through? So uh, the, pro the problem is it's obviously very unusual to have the level one go live without the regulatory technical standards, but we have mm. seen it before. Um, as, as you're probably aware, the level one is very, very high level and very vague. Um, so... I think it's, it's possible for firms to um, meet the high level requirements by, by March, but like you said, you're, it, we're gonna need the regulatory technical standards and it's currently going through a review stage. It's such a complex um, issue and, and a learning curve for yeah. you know, the industry and regulators. So it's hard to put a timeline on it, but at the moment due to apply from 2022. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the difficulty is when you still haven't bottomed out what the scope is, who is in, who's out, it's mm. extremely difficult to make further progress. Any other comments before I move on? Nope. Okay, that's great. And with that, Roy, that probably is a good segue into the work that you've been doing, which is sort of like across not just the securities lending industry, but on a much wider capital markets level. Uh, in some of these areas, 
would you like to tell us what you've been up to? Yeah, so look, um, I, you're right. That's a really great um, kind of baseline to move from. And, and let me make a couple of comments on that. You know, both SFTR and SFDR really are um, parts of, of that kind of alphabet soup of regulation that Danny described really resulting from uh, sort of Pittsburgh uh, in, uh, in 2008. So the reality is the focus is transparency, disclosure, engagement, and we see that through every regulation that's been that's come out over the last uh, dozen years or so. And look, each of those is obviously a laudable goal in its own right. But <clears throat> to me, the reality is it's a question about the practical application of the regulations, right? So, so we've just talked about, you know, the challenges that are thrown up by having late uh, publication of something and then the, the rollout of them. And I think we've, we've seen that because the truth is, most of the regulation we've seen before has not been tinkering. It's been brand new. No one's done these sorts of regulations before. So they're kind of making it up as they go along. And sometimes you get good rules and sometimes you get less good rules. You know, Danny talked about SFTR. And to me, there's two winners out of SFTR. The companies themselves, so the market participants that now definitely, definitely know more about their own businesses than before the SFTR regulation. <clears throat> the other big winners are the people that have sold the supercomputers to all the regulators that are trying to figure out how they're gonna crunch all of the data that they now have with a less than clear outcome of what they're going to do with that data. It's kind of just give us all that, we'll figure out what we're looking for. So I, I think that's really the challenge for regulators, but definitely the market is, is better off and that's, uh, largely down to the leadership of of the various trade associations, so is the um, ICMA uh, as being sort of primary in that group. Um, but look, you know, there's good rules, as I said, and bad rules. A good rule was in 2005, the U.S. brought in a regulation show, and that meant that short sellers had to make sure they could borrow securities before they could export sale, and that would stop. Uh, potential um, supply demand mismatches that would uh, uh, adversely impact the market. So that's good. That was made better by another regulation that came in after the, the, the GFC, which was Reg 204, which then said, not only do you have to make certain you can borrow shares, you actually have to have borrowed those and settled them into the market. And if you're not settled, then you're going to be bought in. So that was a really good rule. Let me give you an example of a less good rule. Best execution for securities lending. If, uh, yeah, who can argue with best execution? You want the best price. You want the best collateral. Can't argue with that. Well, first of all, I can argue what the best collateral is, and I can do that in a whole nother webinar. Um, but best price is pretty straightforward. So, but what if the borrower paying the highest fees giving whatever you've determined is the best collateral is Lehman Brothers? Right, so some transactions don't don't really fit into a best execution model because they involve ongoing risk exposures. So, so there's there's a rule that looks good, but maybe isn't so practical uh, as an example of that. So uh, I call that into question. And look, the other one that people point to is uh, disclosure of short positions. So now you know there's a lot more disclosure uh, publicly uh, once it once short positions cross a certain threshold and to regulators at a, at a much lower level. And so, you know, given all of the activity going on with GameStop at the moment, maybe there's no surprise uh, that, uh, that people have been focusing on this. But look, what's the impact of this? First of all, the only reason that the GameStop trade happened in the first place was because of disclosure of short positions. So it's not the fact that there was no disclosure of it, it's the fact that that information is publicly available and people traded on it. I don't have a problem with that, by the way. I, I think GameStop, there's, there are things to be looked at, but the, uh, the, the, the concerted buying effort from retail investors, I don't have a problem with. The short positions from uh, the hedge funds and other traders, I don't have a problem with any of that. I think the mechanics, there's definitely questions that need to be asked. So. Look, the reality is disclosure isn't always a panacea. Right? And it may not surprise anyone that many hedge funds, many short sellers I know, uh, actually trade to, to just below the reporting threshold so that they don't have to 
uh, publicly disclose. And so what's your answer? Make the levels lower? Well, you know, you have to ask yourself, are we actually better off having short selling as part of uh, all markets, really? Because it exists in FX, it exists in bonds, it exists in equities, uh, derivative positions, <laughs> you're selling, the, you know, they're short positions. So it really is part of the capital market. So to me, if you want to close it off, you really have to remake the markets that we're in today. Now, if we <clears throat> look at sort of the disclosure that's required from SFDR and other regulations, the question is, do you want more scrutiny over what's happening and the validity of assertions that people are making, or do you want less? And if you want more, you need to enable uh, all kinds of views from the market, positive and negative views. Let me quickly turn to securities lending in my last couple of minutes. Uh, look at four things. One is a little bit more on short selling than a look at voting, collateral, and governance. And short selling, uh, I've talked a little bit about it, but look, to me, activist short sellers, <clears throat> and that's not what GameStop is. So this is uh, these are people that are looking at companies like Wirecard and NMC Health. To me, that's the perfect embodiment of the value they add because both Wirecard and NMC Health were members of mainstream indexes, the FTSE 100 and the DAX. And I don't recall a whole lot of long investors or passive uh, index holders calling out uh, Wirecard as being a fraud or NMC Health. And I don't recall regulators doing it. I don't see uh, auditors doing that. I saw newspapers and short sellers. So maybe the market's happier with frauds being part of main indices. Personally, I'm, I'm not, right? So I think, I think there is a role for short sellers that's really valuable. And I have a list of over 30 companies that uh, have been spotted by short sellers uh, and not regulators or long investors. If you flip the other side uh, to being a long holder, voting is obviously always the, the, the challenge, right? And, and SFDR and you know engagement is really, that's at the heart of it. Look, I think it's inevitable that securities lending um, uh, will continue to coexist with a, a more active engagement policy, but I suspect that investors that are lending their assets will become more proactive in managing what's actually available over loan and what actually gets recalled in time to vote. Because remember, any time an investor isn't voting their shares and someone else is, it's because that long investor has chosen not to vote those shares because shares are always recallable. So it's an active choice they're making to make their shares available for short sellers and in fact, activist investors. So. Voting is a choice, and I think just like in Japan, we'll see a two-tier market um, arise, and it's not just Japan. The big thing I think for this year is collateral. If you think of all of the investors that are filtering their investment portfolios on the front end to be very selective about what assets they buy, on the collateral side, if they're letting those assets out, they seem to have let that drift away. That's not important. I'm not thinking about that. Or they do very broad brush uh, exclusions. I'm not going to do the old vice stocks, or I might avoid fossil fuel companies. But then you're actually discriminating against companies that are turning from fossil fuels into energy companies and more sustainable energy companies. And surely what we want to do is promote that activity. So I think, uh, I think there are solutions available. Uh, I think there'll be more, and I think it'll very much be part of the debate. And it'll be forced. If you look at part of the disclosure, how do you make sure this fund is sustainable? And interestingly, I went on a rant uh, probably about 18 months ago about an ETF, an ESG ETF that was being launched, where at the launch they said, but we're only going to cover 80% of the ESG index we're tracking. The, the, the mandatory amount is 80%. Might be higher than 80%, but we can go as low as 80%. Oh, and by the way, it excludes securities lending collateral. So maybe at the peak, it has 20% of its assets on loan. So some investor, some poor investor thinks they're buying an ESG ETF. They might only be holding a 60% ETF in ESG. So, so that's why I think this is a, a, big, uh, a, a big challenge here. So look, uh, I think the challenge for the industry and intermediaries is that regulators are trying to apply new standards. Uh, investors are going to have to deal with that. Uh, fund managers are going to have to uh, adjust and, and, uh, and, and customize their programs. So service providers who want conformity, 
standardization and one size fits all meet regulators who say, no, here's the new one size. And it's the one we dictate Oh, by the way, this regulation is different from the one next door to the one next door to the one next door because there's a regional versus local challenge as well. And I think inevitably what we're gonna have is that we're gonna have to adjust and adapt our models so that it's much more about uh, mass customization rather than mass standardization. And I think that's the challenge for the industry. And I'll shut up. Now that's really interesting. Um, and I think, Roy, I'm in sort of like moving, as you say, from an earlier generation where you just had to sort of like make all the noise. You need to now internalize or operationalize these new uh, standards. Now, particularly looking at the ESG, the governance part of it, I mean, do you see that firms, you know, j just like you mentioned with ESG, ETFs or whatever, are all firms the same or there are different stages of embracing this new, uh, the, the new regulatory sort of like frameworks that we're getting? Yeah, well, I, th I think it's a fundamental challenge of the regulation. If you look at SFTR, SFTR, you know, is, is a rules-based uh, regulation. This is what you have to do. This is when you have to report it. This is what you have to report it, to whom you have to report it, and what sequence is. SFDR, as we've seen, is, is much more principles. You need to disclose things. You need to tell people and you need to report them. And you, you know, but but it's not it's not prescriptive. So so inevitably people will have different interpretations of that. And, and I think that's that's a challenge. So it, at the end of the day, investors who are supposedly the ones that this is being done for, uh, I'm not convinced that in the early stages that they will be necessarily better off. But but I think the thing about all regulations, no regulation comes in perfectly baked. I don't expect that, right? You, you launch something and then you adjust it and you make it better over time. And I think that that's what life is. Yeah, I'll stay away from the ready baked answers, but thank you very much, Roy. Um, Farah, there's a couple of questions that you may want to just have a look at if you tap on the right. Uh, whilst you do that, we will now move towards a general Q&A uh, session. So please, by all means, participants can send uh, their questions in. Um, one question I've got and is actually sort of like to the audience as well as um, our panelists. So if you can just sort of like um, just respond by, um, um, we are going to do a poll if we can. So, I'm going to just wait for the question to pop up. Ah, there we go. So the question is very simply, do we believe that the level of regulation within the securities industry is insufficient, about right, or we think it's basically excessive where we currently stand? This is the Goldilocks question. So whilst we do that, uh, Farah, would you like to address those questions that have come up? Sorry, Ali, I, I can't actually see those questions. Would you mind? Um, would you mind? Sure. If you go up? to the bottom, the three dots under the Q and A, press that, and then you can see it. So we've got a question here. Going back to SFDR, uh, where do you see the impacts for this industry? And do you think SEC lending should be in scope of this particular reg? Um, of course, ESG is relevant and important, but is this reg really aimed at businesses um, such as this? I would say <laughs> uh, the answer to that question, I don't think uh, it was intended, that securities lending was intended to be captured uh, in this regulation I think we've got a we've got a bit of a split membership at the moment so within our ESG working group um, you are in scope of SFDR if you offer portfolio management services um, and half of our membership are deeming securities lending to be uh, portfolio services in terms of Bifid, and, and the other half of our membership are, say, are, are not clarifying it as 
portfolio management services, which has caused a bit of an issue. And uh, like I said, we 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 have an ESG steering group, and with the help of council, we're we're looking to get some some guidance on that. But at the moment, I think it's we just need to wait for further clarification from from the regulator on on and and ask for more clarity on the scope of specific products. I mean, we say that ESG is. Uh, compatible with securities lending but securities lending isn't uh, a specific ESG product so yeah it's a it's a really tricky one. Great thanks a lot Farah and just you mentioned going to council when is that time to what's the timetable can I ask? So we have a session with council tomorrow as part of our ESG uh, steering group and if anyone obviously is an ISLA member and would like to attend that session then then please reach out to me after the call. We'll be there. (laughs) <laughs> we'll all be there. Excellent. Thank you, Vera. We have uh, the results from our um, poll. So if I may, uh, here we go. Well, I'm actually slightly surprised with the 14% thing. There's insufficient. Um, but even bigger surprise, the majority think it's about right. Mm. Was... Um, Roy, if I may bring you in, were you surprised by that poll result? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually most disappointed that panelists and hosts can't vote on that. Um, <laughs> that might have changed the numbers. Uh, <laughs> look, at the end of the day, I, I, I think, uh, as I said before, I think it's difficult to get regulations right, right? They, they have been... They have been trying to put in regulations that they think will make the market better for the first time, right? They're dealing with issues they haven't had to deal with before. They haven't had to deal with ESG before. They knew that there were problems in the system in 2008, 2009. They don't know how to actually track, you know, what those track down what those problems are, where those roadblocks are. I'm not happy with a lot of the regulation but I get why they're there, right? I think some of the regulations like the um, like the penalties involved with proprietary trading, I think it's made it a more volatile market. I, I think people have stepped yes. away from market makers so that we now have voluntary market makers who are there when it suits them and not there when they aren't. So you see yeah. much more gapping up and down in difficult markets. And that's a, a direct creation of, of the regulatory changes. So I'm not I don't think that that helps uh, things, but, but you know, again, I, I have a lot of sympathy for regulators, although I don't ever tell them I say that. Um, but it, it, and and all these will get better. SFTR yeah. is, I think, as I said, is a big winner um, yeah. because companies know more, and that's really to me the the essence of everything. So will investment managers know more because they have to go through the, the the disclosure as a result of SFDR? I think they will learn more about what the key issues are and be able to explain them better. So it doesn't surprise me, but it's still excessive. Sure. Um, if I can bring Danny in, we have a question from Neil Brown, which is uh, talking about the, the SFDR uh, and greenwashing. It's not a comment on you, Danny, but uh, you're on mute. <laughs> so what's Neil saying? He's saying, do you expect genuine change to mainstream investment products from SFDR or will we just go through a lip service greenwashing and dilute any benefit off that? Uh, so thank you for that from Neil. Uh, Neil, by the way, is uh, well known. He's in the, the green market, has been forever. Uh, a bond guy of old, and I think he right, chairs the CISI bond committee. Um, I, I'd say the, the following is two things. I want to just tie in something that Roy said and bring in uh, Neil's there. First of all, you know, we're trying to work out what we already know. And as Roy said, the regulators are trying, you know, it, it, what do we already know and what can we work from? So what we can work from from the bit from SFTR is the following. There's a taxonomy and standards all over the world that have now been adopted yeah. and are being adopted, for instance, for CFTC in the rewrite going through this year. So that's things like LEI. LEI, the counterparty, very important, the LEI, the issuer, the ISIN and so forth. There's a little bit around UPI. It's not as good as it could be, but UTIs and so forth. If you use those things, again, like the Ottolenghi thing, and take all your strings of trades, but to bring those in, you then say, okay, uh, if you did it for, say, a week or a month or whatever, you'd get your position. So there's no position reporting right now, but there is trade reporting. 
But what actually you can report positions. But it's the most difficult thing in the world actually to tie those into to a set of trades making a position for one way or another. But using that taxonomy, at least you can actually say, okay, that is that bond. It's got an implicit rating there. It's in that classification. Because embedded in all this, so there are all these different kind of standards of classifications that only the real, real alchemists understand. But I could tell you this. If, for instance, if I was working with Roy and working there with, with Farah at, at uh, ISTA, we could say, okay, we could help you here, there, and there quite straightforwardly by taking the ingredients for you to put into the Otolenghi cookbook and then do what you want, want with it. And because that is available and it's available in the firms and each of the firms has it in a string in the same way. So long as you know what you're looking for. So I'd say, uh, look at the classifications, look to ICMA as well, the work that they've done around there, look to ISDA, and that then we'll take it into that. Do I think with greenwashing, by that, I wonder to, what does, does Neil mean? Is that people will just like, for instance, do a reverse repo because you have a title to it and that would count count towards your numbers i guess he, he means like that and there's a bit of a discussion over whether they, that would count or not but it is on your balance sheet stays on the balance sheet of someone else that means it's doubled up it sounds like devarb and all that all that tax dodging <laughs> that went on until recently can i mention that oh i did sorry <laughs> in front of 116 <laughs> people never mind so yeah yeah i think the, you know what it i would I do that? I wouldn't do that, of course. But, you know, could you do that? Mm. Just reversing the right kind of security for sure. I think one thing to look at would be the following. is to look what the Bank of England does next because it, mm. there was, the Bank of England was encouraged to not lend money through open market operations to, uh, to the wrong, let's just say the wrong kind of securities. If they were to go the other way and only lend it against sustainable ones, and I'd, by that I, just, I don't mean green bonds that are issued by uh, central governments, that is included, but I mean the others that fit the category, that would change all sorts of things. And then when you have a primary repo market, like open market operations at the Bank of England, or the ECB and so forth, that dictates uh, behavior in the secondary market. So I'm digging myself out of a hole here because I don't really know what he means by greenwashing. <laughs> and you're so bright, and I hope that answered it. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you've added probably this two, three webinars just on what you've said, Danny. Thank you very much for that. Um, Farah, I mean, do you think it's lip service? I'm coming to you, Roy. Just... Give me one minute because I'm building up to an argument. Good question. My apologies. Right. Farah, do, do you think it's um, it's lip service or is this now the time to essentially move towards this pure articulation of policy towards compl comply and explain? I, th I think it's going to be pretty hard not to comply, especially when the... Hmm. Like when Danny said, when the taxonomy um, is released, which is obviously a list of um, activities with specific performance criteria with regards to their con contribution to environmental objectives, for example, um, that's going to create a common language for financial institutions, investors and policymakers. Once you've got that standardization and, and that that common ground, um, everybody is going to be reporting, you know, to the same criteria. Fantastic. So you're a believer, basically. Definitely. Good. Um, Roy, I'm going to ask you to do three questions in one go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> which is, first of all, I know you've been personally involved with these big principles. And which are looking across the industry. So this, this idea of greenwashing or lip service, is that essentially what we're doing? We're just complying with a piece of legislation or do you see a big fundamental shift in the way that business is going to be done? So that's the first question. And the second, I would like you to wrap two questions. We have got a question from Rashana and also Drew, which are to do with short sales. Um, if you could, perhaps touch on that secondly. Okay, um, great. So let me go back to the fundamental thing. You know, I, I think just with the answers that we've heard from Danny and Farah, we actually, we, we see different interpretations as to what greenwashing might even be. Mm -hmm. And if you add on to that, you know, what companies themselves might be doing in terms of promoting themselves, I, I think it's almost like the phrase of, you know, how do you, how can you tell when a politician is lying, you know, their lips move. I think there will be, I think there will be uh, definitely companies that promote strongly their green credentials, 
that also need to be tested, that that will be on the face of it complying with what the regulations are, but uh, actually in the practice of it won't be. And, and that's, that's again where I see on all of these aspects of it, there is a combination of regulatory uh, oversight and, and testing and um, short selling, right? At the end of the day, is the market better off with Citroen research saying, we're not gonna do any more short reports because of the abuse that they've taken over GameStop, right? I, I don't think that makes a better market. Markets are made up of opinions. And so I think I think that's very much, you know, sort of tied into that. And trust me, we will need more people checking greenwashing credentials rather than fewer, is, is my prediction. Partly, you know, people will make mistakes. You genuinely think that they're complying, as well as those people with more malevolent uh, goals. So, uh, so I, I, I think Neil's asking the right question: Will things change, or won't they? I, I think that's, I think that's a great, uh, I think that's a great question. Um, Sorry, Roy. Can I just pick up on on something there? So, just talking about standardization again and greenwashing. So, there's there's actually two ongoing work streams at the moment, which. Um, have arisen as a result of increased uh, um, scrutiny of sustainability related service advisors um, and a recent study from the uh, commission has just been released which points to the need to uh, legislate and su supervise uh, sustainability related ratings um, as well as data and uh, research providers to ensure uh, transparency and oversight of the accuracy of their services, which is going to help help a lot, right, towards SFDR. Um, and as well as that, you you also have um, IOSCO Sustainability Task Force running at the moment, uh, which is looking at providers of ESG ratings. There's actually a questionnaire that uh, it closes on the 19th of February, which is asking if there is an industry need for regulatory oversight of, of these providers. And I'm sure the outcome is going to be you know, a resounding yes. So it's going to become more and more yeah. um, difficult to, to greenwash, I think. Uh, well, that would be like saying we've had hundreds of years of accounting standards and it's really difficult to uh, fraudulently account for companies. I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that, right? And, and we see that all kinds of frauds get away with things year in, year out, with lots of experts, lots of experience, and lots of professionals involved. So I'm, I'm sorry, that's, that's, a, that's a general solution, but it will never capture uh, people with economic motives. And, and people have economic motives in this, and so they will find ways around it. So, um, sorry. So there was, there was a two, second part to Drew's question, which I think is a really important one. I don't know, Roy, if you looked at that, which is in, linked to the short selling, which is, is the market fundamentally changing because of, you know, the the retail investor participation? Because that's really what happened at GameStop. Yeah, look, I I think retail participation uh, definitely is changing it. So it it's a good question. I don't know that it's changing it uh, for the worse, and I don't necessarily think that anything in itself needs to change. You know, GameStop, the 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 initial trading came about because some clever person went gee, this looks like a short squeeze candidate. Why don't we squeeze that short and make some money from it? And a bunch of people went, oh, that's a great idea. The, the issue is actually the infrastructure for the executing brokers servicing the retail uh, investors that couldn't meet their clearing obligations and had to stop trading. That's where, to me, that's where the issue is, right? So, so to me, that's another issue of piping. And so absolutely that needs to be looked at. But you know, if the market changes, I'm not convinced because we've already seen GameStop fall off. Um, you know, a friend of mine sent me through uh, a, a similar story from Piggly Wiggly, uh, which was a real uh, supermarket in the in the 20s, and the same thing kind of happened, right? So there was a, a, a company that was, wanted to wanted to overexpand, couldn't. Uh, short sellers, I mean, buyers went. I know we can do a short squeeze. The the company bought uh, stock, leveraged up. Stock price went through the roof. Investors walked away. Share price crashed. Yeah. So were bust. I understand that the mechanics of it, but Roy, the question is specifically: Are we seeing a fundamental redrawing of boundaries or lines? Basically, you're getting polarized views. Where the you know now Elon Musk has basically joined the bandwagon as well. That shorts are bad and so on. Is this going to play itself out? Are we going to see a fundamental shift, or will just peter away? 
the first, the first complaint about short selling being manipulative uh, and supporting speculators was 1609. Uh, it, we're, we're more than 400 years later. Uh, my prediction is 400 years from now, some people will still think it's, uh, it's abusive and some people will think it's, it's normal. Look, well, I keep going back to this is about choice. Remember, everyone that buys a stock or a bond is expressing a different view from the person that sold it to them, right? So everything is built on, on opposing views. Short sellers just have an opposing view to, to a long investor. And it doesn't make one or the other right. Time will tell. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to take, um, we have a question in the chat box, which is Ernie Adib who has asked about uh, impact of Brexit and specifically um, its impact on usage and investment funds um, and what that will do. Uh, would it add more complexity or is it supposed to make things simpler? If I may bring Farah into that discussion, uh, do you have a view on that? Um, so I'm not sure specifically about uh, USIT, but in November last year, the uh, UK published uh, an interim report and a roadmap towards mandatory climate related disclosures, which outlined at a high level the UK's approach to implementing the uh, recommendations of the FSB's task force on climate related disclosures. Um, the broad aim in line with the government's 2019 green finance strategy is to make TCFD aligned disclosures mandatory across the UK by 2025 with a significant number of other mandatory requirements to be enforced by uh, 2023. Um, however, in that report, there was no mention of SFDR uh, at all. And it seems pretty clear at this point that the UK aren't looking uh, to implement it. Uh, although it could be possible that there will be a UK version of SFDR in the future. Um, the report does make a fleeting reference to ensuring that there will be uh, in, you know, ongoing interactions with related international initiatives, uh, including uh, those that are going to come out of the EU Sustainable Finance uh, Action Plan. And, uh, you know, Sustainability is obviously a priority for the UK. We're hosting the United Nations COP conference in Glasgow this year. Um, and the UK government did also announce that it's going to adopt the framework for the EU taxonomy that we've just been discussing. So uh, we're already starting to see some regulatory divergence um, as a result of Brexit, I think. Excellent. I've actually just posted in the chat box HM Treasury's um, consultation on the the funds regime that they are looking to. So there may be, as you say, potentially divergence. We may be going down the sort of like Singapore on Fontaine sort of like route. Let's see where that works out. But I think until the MOU for Brexit is there, I think it's difficult to predict. I don't know. Danny, Roy, do you have any views on the Brexit and the lending industry? Yeah, can I jump in on that one? Uh, the so the MOU is looks like it's going to be light. Uh, it's kind of like an overhang. So first of all, you know, we never signed Brexit in thirty first December. Do you know that it's not been signed? And the European Union has now said this talk this morning to put off the signing because of some of the things that have gone on at the borders and whatever. So so we've got that. Um, I think there's going to be regulatory di divergence, but I I still think. The regulatory divergence by the EU will equal the regulatory divergence by the EU from where we stand now. And that I think the back channels are saying, right, oh, a lot of this regulation that came in was well-intended. We've now learned what's good and bad. Why don't we go back and just pick the good bits? And there are some good bits in there. You know, don't forget that we, you know, our people designed MIFID too. We wish they hadn't, but they did. But so there's, I, I think what happens, the UK will not be a rule taker, be a rule maker. They've, the Bank of England has made that clear. But I do, I still, still think there's a lot of things that we'll do the same. I don't think anyone in, in five years time, eight years time, no one's going to do the things the way we're doing them right now, that the nuttiness that have gone on around some of the reporting and so forth. And that's what I think, but that does, that's not necessarily a conflict 
In fact, the standard regulatory standards that we've got across the world are getting, as I say, getting adopted by CFTC and so forth. So there'd be more consistency there, but it'd be much more sens sensible and applied to, to, to both uh, the EU and the UK. Roy, you're the um, impartial party in this. I think Canadian, isn't it? <laughs> He'll kill me if I said American, so anyway. Yeah, well, as, as, as I said, yeah, the reality is I don't have a problem standing in uh, passport queues because I've been doing it uh, uh, since 87 when I moved here. And in fact, Canada was always one of those countries that never had a special lane for Canadian, for its citizens. So I've been getting accused my whole life. So I have zero sympathy for anyone that thinks it's harder to move across borders now. Um, but look, I think Danny's, I think Danny's point's right. Look, as, as regulations move on, there will be a general tendency towards convergence anyway, if not if not duplication, they will become more similar. UMR is a great example of a global regulation that really is a global regulation that has had the intended impact and is really, we are better off. It is, it is unique in that we are better off because that regulation uh, is in place. And, but there, there's always different speeds. So Basel, how long have we been trying to put in the different Basel regulations and countries still do it at different speeds? Right, and it advantages or disadvantages yeah. the constituents of, of the various countries that will carry on. The UK has an opportunity to to make up some of the ground it's lost to uh, to, to American banks. So from from a UK bank position, uh, Europe is is taking a different direction and and doesn't mind disadvantaging their banks. And that to me, that's part of the reason why we've had a, a slower recovery in Europe after the GFC. Um, and Switzerland, you know. It, is trying to carve out its own place and not be bullied more than it needs to be bullied. Um, so, and, and Asia is doing their own thing and look, that will carry on. So, and that provides opportunities and, uh, and challenges. Alas, I'm just conscious of time. Um, I'm going to just go around and ask one of our panelists to either just share their own views. We had two other questions we had to uh, cover. One was around looking at crystal ball. What will we be talking about a year from now? The other one was uh, what changes would you make to the regulations if you were holding the pen? So really up to you. You can either answer, answer one of those questions or just share your final thoughts with us. Starting with you, Farah, if I may. Sure. I think the important thing for us is, is Isla promotes the fact that we believe that ESG regulations such as SFDR can be compatible with securities lending and we can integrate uh, sustainability factors into our practices. Mm -hmm. However, I do feel that securities lending in itself it, it shouldn't be determined as an ESG um, product of sort. So under SFDR, if a product promotes sustainable characteristics, then you are subject to certain requirements under the regulation as if you are offering an ESG product. So as an industry, I think we just need to be careful that we don't inadvertently pull ourselves into the scope of other regulatory requirements by, by stating that our, that our product is ESG compatible. And, and that's something that we're working through with the membership in the working groups at the moment. So. Uh, just on that, for I mean, Absolutely, I understand where you're coming from because securities lending is part of a much bigger investment strategy and so on. I mean, what work is taking place with the likes of, say, for example, ICMA, ISDA, and the other trade associations? I mean, we see the regulators through the ESA coming together um, in, in articulating that. Is that something that you see over the horizon, a lot more trade associations working together? Yes, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned before, ISLA are trying to establish uh, interim best practices and guidance for our membership at the moment with the help of council, obviously. And uh, in addition to looking at SFDR, our ESG and uh, collateral management steering group are teaming up at the moment to review mm -hmm. how we can integrate ESG principles into standardized collateral schedules across the market as well as looking at best practices around voting, like you mentioned, and corporate governance as a whole. And in addition to ISLA, uh, ICMA have also done a considerable amount of work establishing green and social bond standards. So I would definitely, like you say, encourage firms to reach out to your friendly trade association representing your industry if you have any concerns and 
obviously we can bring that to a wider forum and, and, and talk through the solutions. Thank you very much, Farah. Um, who would like to go next? Roy, Danny? Uh, beauty before age, Danny, go ahead. I'll be real quick on this one. But when things weren't looking too good in terms of a lot of reporting, we went down to see IOSCO uh, in, uh, in uh, Madrid, all the tra trade repositories. And we offered to work with them. We said, give us a case of red and a week, and we'll be able to come up with a UPI for you. And actually what's happened is a standardization, you were just saying about the standard uh, collateral schedules and so forth. Loads has already been done. There's a, one or two gaps. And I'd say... FSB, IOS, cross IOSCO, the same crowd, go see them and say that LEI works, UTI works, and so forth. UPI is going to be a difficult thing. If people really want to do things correctly, just close that one out. Then we've got the suite. So at least you can start from something and say, right, this is this, this is that, this is debt, this is equity, this is repo, security, and so forth. And then it becomes much, well, that's the, if you will, the quality uh, around it. Then into, that, that's, that's the science. The art around it then, which I think is SFDR, is where you build from. But uh, I'd encourage, go down to Madrid, same story, case of red, over a week. Uh, will you be paying for the hotel trip on the way back? Oh, you can't come back yet, <laughs> right. Let's not do it today. Let's do it on, you know, March 22nd. <laughs> Roy, you've already given us the tip that collateral is the new frontier. What else have you got in your bag of tricks? Uh, no, look, I, I'd encourage uh, people to do what, what Farah asked. Uh, the, the reason SFTR was successful was because of the role of the, uh, uh, of the trade associations. I think the challenge with um, ESG is that it's a bigger issue. So it's the trade associations from multiple industry groups sort of coming together on more of a global scale. And, and the kind of advocacy that trade associations have been doing with respect to SFTR, for instance, uh, now needs to be refocused on to ESG, but it is a bigger issue. And so I think this year, what I'd like to see by the end of this year is uh, forward progress on, on practical things like actual collateral, which, which can be done, and uh, strong positions on the principles governing the business, which then allow things to, to kind of become more BAU uh, from 2022. So this is the year for debate, challenge, and engagement, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Excellent. Um, with that, thank you very much. I think we have had a wonderful discussion. And importantly, a very big thank you to our participants whose questions were really spot on. Uh, we've tried to handle most of them. If I haven't, and I've fallen short, my apologies. And um, I think sort of like our panelists, I mean, I found them so uh, enlightening and engaging. I'm sure they will be happy to take the discussion offline. So with that, a very big thank you to the guys at CISI, CISI TV, who made this uh, possible. And uh, with that, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. And big thank you to our panelists. Well done, guys. Thank you.